South Americans were doing this in the 50s, 40s, and 50s, and even before. Um, but Canadians, of course, are not complaining. It won't be nearly as much fun because it was so great without Americans. But, um, to, a, to which, you know, lots of lots of others say, you know, say, well, the Canadians can be obnoxious too. And, you know, um, the tourist dollars floated in to Cuba, but they mostly went to U.S. investors and the corrupt elite that was closely allied to, to Batista. Most Cubans were poor and getting poorer. It wasn't that Cuba was you know, an overwhelmingly poor country and by Latin American standards it wasn't. What, what made it, what, I think what made this a charged situation is that Cuba, more than any other nation in Latin America, intersected with the opulence of, of, US, of the United States, right? I mean, Cuban workers, you know, Cuban nationalists, they saw an enormous clash between these sort of huge, you know, hotels and all the money and the sort of the luxury and the decadence flowing through these casinos, and then they, you know, reflected on their own life, right, and, and the distance between that and, and their own existence. And this really raised economic and nationalist resentment. This is certainly true of Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro was a middle class son of Spanish immigrants, so it's not like he was, you know, hard scrabble, many generations Cuban, right? he, he had fairly comfortable upbringing. But really, like many middle class nationalists, was, was really offended by uh, the, the way that they believed the United States and its interests were treating Cuba. The irony is he almost had a very different relationship with the United States. Castro was apparently a really great baseball pitcher. And baseball, of course, being the major sport in Cuba, as it is in many places in Latin America that been occupied by the U.S. And he was offered a big time major league contract, I think by the Brooklyn Dodgers, which he turned down. How, how different the 20th century would have been if he had, he had chosen. That chosen that, and 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 Castro instead decides to uh, uh, seize his destiny as, as leading his, his nation in a different direction. And he's a brilliant and a charismatic leader. Right? This is my all-time favorite shot of him at Che Guevara. This is the Argentine, his Argentine uh, 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 partner and, and, and collaborator. And if ever any if ever any picture ever showed like the uh, the, the image of so radical. Latin American, you know, plotting revolutionary at this point. Can't do any better than that. In late 56, Castro and 82 rebels landed on a very, literally sailed in this leaky, tiny yacht called, believe it or not, the Grandma, um, which then became the title of their sort of party uh, 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 journal uh, after during his regime. So the grandma, they sail on the grandma, they, barely, they almost sink. They land in eastern Cuba, actually right, right here, and they're hoping to launch a revolution. 82, 82 men. They're almost slaughtered at the very beginning. Uh, Castro and, and, and Guevara and just a few of their uh, uh, fellow rebels escape, and they escape into the, into the Sierra, Ma Sierra Maestra Mountains, which are sort of uh, uh, this area here, in the mountainous, much more rugged part of Cuba. And to the surprise of many, they survive, and they hold out, and they start building a following. And over the next few years, to the shock of almost everyone except for maybe Castro, they've got a growing movement that increasingly threatens the Batista regime's control. Now, as the revolution, you can kind of get a sense here of the final year, really. So the, so the, so the final year push from March 58 to, to January 59, you can see sort of the movement west. You can see how far west Havana is. Now, this is almost all sort of uh, uh, sugar country, much sort of lower plains and Hot uh, is a really rugged, more rural area. Um, as the revolution builds, you know, by 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 early to or the spring of '58, you know, American officials are trying to figure out how to respond to it. You know, we're not kind of uncomfortable with Batista. And Americans often, you know, they like their dictators until people start rising up against them, and then they sort of, uh, kind of uncomfortable. What do you do with these guys? 
really want to be seen as being on the side of the unpopular dictator. He goes, okay, a year ago, but now. So what do we do? Um, this is a pattern that often occurs where, you know, about this time when a revolution rises up, it happened in Iran in 78, 79. Well, we better get rid of them. Let's ease them out before the crazies take over. We'll try to find somebody moderate. And they're, they're trying to figure that out. The problem is that this happens so fast. You know, by the fall of 1958, the Cuban army is collapsing. It's retreating back toward Havana. Batista seems wor more worried about sort of gathering up his money and fleeing than he does about fighting this war. And U.S. officials decide the only way to, 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 to hold off a Castro victory is to ease Batista out, to sort of get him out and find somebody else. But they don't really, they can't really find a moderate middle. There isn't really a moderate middle by this time. And so they're forced to deal with this reality that, that, that on New Year's Day, 1959, Castro and his rebels take control of Havana. This is actually taken, this, this picture is taken in Santiago here, um, where U.S. troops originally occupied in 1898. So Castro's not in Havana. Then if you've ever seen, you guys seen Godfather 2? <coughs> actually, no, better yet, who hasn't seen Godfather 2? Okay, so go see the Godfather 2. What's wrong with you? Um, but but uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 a large portion of that movie takes place in Havana, and which is just it's a great sort of piece of, of, uh, of fictional history. And, and it takes place in these last fateful days of, of Havana about to fall and miss its revolution. So you can see you know, uh, sort of uh, an insight, perhaps, into what, the, what might have been going on with the mafia as, as this revolution is, is sweeping into power. At the time, Castro had not come out as a communist. No one really knew who he was, and in fact, believe it or not, um, there were American kids, uh, uh, you know, teenagers, teenage boys who throughout, you know, 57 and 58 were actually sporting big Castro beards, you know, to celebrate him, because they sort of saw, saw these guys as these kind of brave, manly rebels. So it was not entirely clear that, that he's going to clash with the U.S. But, and, and I should say, some U.S. officials hoped he wouldn't. In fact, as a young senator named John F. Kennedy in 59, thinking about making a president of Romney, he makes a couple speeches saying, just give Castro time, be patient, it'll probably be reasonable, don't worry. But the problem is that the goals of the two sides were incompatible. The U.S. could accept the overthrow of Castro, but it wasn't going to accept any kind of revolution that threatened U.S. control of the island, or at least U.S. economic control. And this is an important distinction for, for to understand about the U.S. and the role it's played in the world, is the United States has often accepted political change, political revolutions, as long as economic relationships are not threatened, right? as long as those re revolutions don't get too radical. But Castro intended the total national liberation, he called it. He wanted, essentially, to redeem the revolution that he believed had been crushed in 1898. And there's Think about sort of the big clash of memories here, right? The Americans had been, you know, most Americans at the time had learned in their in their textbooks in, in, in you know in middle school and high school that the United States had intervened in Cuba to save Cuba and to help it gain independence, whereas Cubans had learned their memory was that the U.S. had intervened and crushed their revolution and sort of tried to take control of Cuba right as they were on the cusp of beating Spain. So you have these two different memories. When Castro comes into Santiago, right? And you see it's just right after this, this is right after this moment actually. He makes a speech in Santiago in which he says, this time the revolution will not be thwarted. This time the revolution will be consummated. It will not be like the War of 1895, that was the, the revolution that had been launched then. When the Americans arrived and made themselves masters of the country, <coughs> they intervened at the last minute and later did not even allow the patriots who had been fighting for 30 years to enter Santiago. Now this is bizarre to Americans. They're like, what? What? Eisenhower, right? Still president at the time, is 59, January 59. He's at a press conference, and the reporter says, "You know, this is what Castro just said. Do you have any response to this?" And Eisenhower says, "Quote: I have no idea of the possible motivations of such a man. I do feel this. Here's a country that you would believe, on the basis of our history, would be one of our real friends." The whole history, first our intervention in 1898, our making and helping set up Cuban independence, the very close relationships that have existed most of the time with them, 
would seem to make it a puzzling matter to figure out exactly why the Cubans would be so unhappy. I don't exactly know what the difficulty is. Or as was put in the 21st century by so many American commentators in response to, to uh, the hostility from a different region of the world, why do they hate us? Now, with this sort of profound clash of memory, uh, what, what the relationship was about, it's probably inevitable that there's going to be hostility. So this question of sort of contingency. Could it have gone differently because the United States have adopted a different policy and not had this clash with the Cuban Revolution that you know, brought on more than 50 years of hostility? I mean, if you think about it, 55 years of hostility, right? Could it have gone differently? Well, maybe, but the U.S., uh, uh, maybe, it's, maybe, it's, maybe it's inevitable that there's a clash. But maybe the U.S. could have done things differently. It didn't help, for example, that the United States refused to talk to Castro. They basically believed he's going to have to come around. He's ni they're 90 miles from Florida. They can't, I mean, you can't sail Cuba into the Atlantic. I mean, you've got to deal with us right here. All Cuban leaders have had to deal with the United States. He's going to have to come to terms. But instead, Castro moved ahead with his program. He executed figures from the Batista regime, including some who had been close to US diplomats and investors. He nationalized foreign property, including US property. He closed the mafia-owned brothels and casinos. When the United States government responded to this by threatening to cut the Cuban sugar quota, which is really the economic lifeline, the other economic lifeline was tourism, and sugar exports to the U.S. that really made the Cuban economy go. So the U.S. threatens to take this away. Castro, instead of coming to terms, reaches out to the Soviet Union and reaches an agreement for Moscow to buy Cuban sugar. You can see how this tit for tat happens, right? Then Washington responds to economic sanctions, and Castro, in a manner that might have come, come from my six-year-old son, responds, oh yeah, well, I'm a communist. I said I wouldn't say that, but I'm just going to go by myself. You won't take me to the park? I'm going to go there. When he's 16, he'll say it. What's that? When he's 16. Yeah, yeah. When he's 16. 16, 17. Oh, yeah, well, I'm a communist. Well, <laughs> um, this certainly, you know, this. This leads us to these questions, right? I mean, could this have gone differently? It might have gone differently. Could the United States have been more conciliatory? And, and they, you know, I mean, my own view of this, and this is another good historical term, right? You guys are talking about causation, right? What, co what causes you know, certain decisions and certain events to happen? I would perhaps argue, lots of people said, oh, the U.S. could have done this differently. I would perhaps argue that this clash was what we call overdetermined, meaning there were so many factors leading toward a break between Castro and the United States. So many factors, you know, the historical hostility, the distrust, you know, the supercharged nature of the Cold War, the resentment of these, uh, uh, you know, of, uh, of this revolution from the US perspective, even before it took these decisions. I would argue that there were so many factors pushing toward a break that it's almost it's difficult to figure out which one was operative, which one was decisive. But still, even if it looks inevitable, this clash of Cuban hostility to the US, many Americans were furious. There was, a, there was this notion, very similar to the response of the Iranian Revolution, that the United States had been betrayed. Betrayed by a nation that thought it had helped, that it thought it had been friends with. And among those who felt betrayed personally, as well as nationalistically, was John F. Kennedy himself. He had spoken out for patience for Castro, and now he felt like Castro had betrayed him, betrayed the revolution. He took this very personally, of course, because he was running for president at the time this was all happening, and he was very worried that his words of patience with Castro were going to come back and haunt him. And he was going to be able to be painted by, by his opponent, Richard M. Nixon, as being soft on communism, because that's what Richard M. Nixon did. So he was, he's angry, Castro, in almost a personal political sense, and like, you betrayed me, challenging my, my bid for the presidency. Well, he wins that bid, barely, 
and he becomes the youngest elected president in U.S. history. And he's determined to prove, as he had said in his inaugural address, that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. He was he wanted to convey this image that, that you know the this new generation of Americans, the first as the first president born in the 20th century. You know, I'm gonna be, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this nation moving again. We're gonna be more aggressive and dynamic in our approach to the world, our approach to the Cold War. Now Kennedy is a really fascinating character, as everyone probably knows, and and you know there have been li whole libraries of books written on him, including obviously you know hundreds of books written about his assassination, but one or two of them worth reading, most not. Most not. Kennedy was actually a very thoughtful man. He had a good grasp of, of global issues, but he also had a lot going on uh, beneath the surface. He had a lot to hide. Um, first of all, he was, he was very physically ill and ailing. He suffered from a range of, of problems, actually. Addison's disease, for which he took uh, a range of medication. He had a very bad back. He had been injured in World War II. And, and he was on really a cocktail of drugs often to deal with these problems. <coughs> but also, partly because of these, these problems, he felt driven, really, to, to look tough and decisive. He brought into office with him a group of young, and brilliant, and arrogant men, dubbed by some the best and the brightest who included figures like the former Ford Company President, Robert McNamara, who became Defense Secretary. And they believed, they came in, they believed really that, that the Eisenhower administration hadn't been just on the move enough, hadn't been dynamic enough in the approach to the Cold War. They let, let the US fall behind in some ways, and certainly in the contest for the Third World. They wanted a more expansive and flexible approach to the Cold War. One of their favorite projects, for example, was the expansion of the US Special Forces. They loved this sort of notion of the Green Berets and the you know, like toughness of, of counterinsurgency, the ability, they wanted to build the ability of the United States to get into these sort of guerrilla wars and, and fight them. He also pushed for massive increases in military spending you know, elsewhere. But the one place that he was determined, determined to prove his toughness to get a victory was Cuba. And Cuba really became an obsession for Kennedy and for, for a lot of his advisors. And when he came into office, he essentially demanded of the CIA, what do you, what do you have? What do you have going? What do you have to deal with, with Castro? And, and the CIA director, that, Alan Bella, sat down and said, Mr. President, basically, you're in luck. We have a plan. We have a plan already in place. Um, to overthrow Castro, and we just need your okay. And, it's, and with that plan, as it turns out, was based on a successful coup that had taken place in Guatemala in 1954. And lots of the veterans of that in the CIA were going were gonna to carry this out too. And it basically, it was a fairly simple plan of <coughs> uh, equipping Cuban exiles, you know, who had been who had either fled or been, been <coughs> chased out by Castro, angry, more conservative Cuban exiles would be supported by the US, and Kennedy promised, you know, in addition to helping to arm them and equip them, he, he at least implied air support for this. Um, they would land in a, a, a bay called the Bay of Pigs in western, southwestern Cuba, and you know, land there, uh, uh, get a beachhead, hopefully make contacts with local opponents of Castro, and eventually help spark a popular uprising. That was, that was the, the thinking. There are lots of problems with their thinking, though. First of all, they didn't really know the, uh, not just the lay of the land, I guess, but the lay of the sea floor of the Bay of Pigs. And for anybody that's been in the Western Caribbean, especially around this area, what's it famous for? When you go snorkeling, what do you want to see? The reefs, the coral reefs are so beautiful. And it's perilous if you're a boat. And as it turns out, so they, they aim to make this landing uh, an area with really, that's really thick, with beautiful and jagged coral reefs. Try that in mind. Second, U.S. officials fell victim to their own sort of ideology, and their ideology was, well, we all know that communist nations are captive nations. 
if people are held captive by a dictatorial government that couldn't possibly support them. Ergo, their, their since Castro has been, you know, declared himself communist, the Cuban people must have turned against him to some degree. And all they need is a spark. And, that, and, that, and then that, that revolution against him will catch fire. They had no way of really understanding or no desire to understand that he might actually have popular support. And the third thing was, or third problem with this plan, was that Castro was ready because they had realized that the US might, might you know, try to carry out something like this. Um, che Guevara had actually been in, in Guatemala when that, when that coup had happened. And so the result is a fiasco, the Bay of Pigs fiasco. The, the sh a lot of the landing craft run into coral reefs and, and sink. And so the, the, the guys in the boats have to jump out of their heavy equipment. Lots of them drown or have to ditch their equipment. Uh, and they're very quickly either killed or captured on the beach. It's devastating defeat for the Cuban exiles, but it's also humiliating for Kennedy. Because you know he has to figure out sort of how do I respond to it. First of all, that the lots of conservatives who were uh, in the CIA and these exiles were furious at Kennedy because he didn't when they got in trouble he didn't send in the air support. He just let them just let them get captured, and slaughtered on the beach. But Kennedy is himself is angry. He's angry at the CIA. He believed that they had sort of assured him that this would work and it didn't work and he's kind of grumpy and he's actually having a bit. I mean, there's, there's great recordings of, of Kennedy in this period when there was a taping system and a recording system in the mobile office then. And, um, and he's sort of storming around having ta almost tantrums against the military and the, and the CIA. CIA. And then she has to go in front of the television cameras and take responsibility. And the interesting thing about this is he apologizes. But it's clear if you watch that clip, he's not really apologizing for a violation of another nation's sovereignty. Well, he really shouldn't have done that. It's against the UN. He was basically apologizing for failure. We're sorry we did that and we failed. And in fact, of course, the lesson he takes from this is not to you know, no longer violate human sovereignty. It's rather to find other ways to get rid of Castro. And in fact, following the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy and his advisors become literally obsessed with Tapo and Castro. His, his attorney general, who was also his brother, Robert Kennedy, later admitted, we were hysterical. We were hysterical about Cuba. And Bobby Kennedy, bear in mind, the attorney general, right, the, the head of the Department of Justice, the chief law enforcement officer of the United States, it ends up running overseeing the entire campaign to try to overthrow or assassinate Fidel Castro. It's called Operation Mongoose. Great name. So many operations have terrible names. That one's great. Operation Mongoose. And this included not just propaganda, economic warfare, but also, like I said, assassination plots on Castro and other Cuban officials. Now, this is all, Americans didn't know about this until the mid-1970s, when all this came out in congressional investigations. And this stuff is so amazingly crazy. You could not possibly sell a movie script, a novel, with these ideas. But indeed, they're, they're true. They so tried these. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. So one was um, the, the, there was uh, attempts, various attempts, Castro was known as a womanizer, various attempts to uh, recruit exiled Cuban women to go back and seduce Castro and try to slip to poison and his in his drinks or poison or, or, or you know, prick him with a poison with a hyper with a needle to poison him. There are uh, uh, efforts to on uh, several occasions, remember this is coming out of the Attorney General's office, to recruit uh, mafia assassins to, to carry out the killing of Castro. Um, at one point the, the CIA guys are sitting around brainstorming and they and they actually I'm gonna tell you the ones that have carried it out at least attempted. I'm not going to tell you the ones that got to but they're sitting around brainstorming, and a couple of the, the ideas they come up with are um, maybe we can slip LSD, which is the CIA is using as an interrogation device at the time. Maybe we can slip LSD, uh, either to put it on the microphone or, or you know, get it somehow into him right before speech, and it become totally incoherent and look like an idiot, and then they'll be able to go out. Or, and they're sitting here and they do try that, they try that. Or, 
Soviet citizens had to live under that fear. 
And it's also possible that Khrushchev hoped that by putting these missiles into Cuba, it would give him some leverage over some other issues in the Cold War, especially the US, or I guess the Western presence, the Western control over West Berlin, right, which is you know, a, 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 an outpost of NATO in the middle of Eastern East Germany. So there's all these factors. But the plan was to get these missiles into Cuba secretly, and then once they're all set up, all operational, then you announce their presence and the United States is caught off guard and you have this victory. The problem was that in mid-October of 62, US spy planes photographed the missiles. And on October 16th, a deeply shaken President Kennedy convenes his key advisors to face the most dangerous crisis in the nation's history. In the 13 days that followed, the Kennedy team interpreted this, the Cuban Missile Crisis, as it quickly became known, solely as a Cold War issue. And of course, it was in many ways a Cold War issue. But what was interesting in, in their discussions, you can see sort of the range of these missiles that, that's, uh, that, are, that are estimated here. The range of these discussions that, that Kennedy has with his advisors, none of them sort of asked the question, and maybe you wouldn't expect it at the time, but none of them asked the question, well, how did we get here to this place? And, how, and, that, and, and more importantly, you know, how, did, how was Cuba made to be the stage on which this, this, this crisis would be played out? It's only possible, of course, because of the US clash with Castro. Now, as you, as you heard in that speech I gave at the very beginning, right, that Kennedy never delivered, one of the very first impulses at this meeting that Kennedy has with his advisors was to attack. To attack before the missiles are operational. Either through an airstrike or an invasion or some combination. And what's interesting is, of course, that's exactly the kind of policy that caused the missiles to be put there in the first place, right? Invasion of Cuba. But it made sense at first glance, and I want to emphasize that at first glance, because there was this feeling of, you know, we've got to get these out of here, they're right next to us, maybe they're not operational, but that's what we should do. And what's interesting is that we have, you can see the table here of the executive committee, of all the sort of top advisors, military advisors and such, and you have all these internal politics going on. The Air Force, which has grown immensely in power in the 50s and early 60s, um, and it is now under Secretary, uh, uh, Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Ernest L uh, uh, LeMay, um, who is, who is uh, I'm sorry, Curtis LeMay, who is um, uh, known quite rightly as <coughs> bombs away LeMay, because his solution was always, well, you just bomb. You just bomb. And he, was, uh, he was a guy that you know, had, had, had really orchestrated uh, the strategic bombing of Japan during World War II. And his solution was always to bomb. And you know his his uh, discussions with the president, and remember these are almost all recorded because Kennedy has this recording system. You know are really fascinating. You can say, well, yeah, for this president, uh, you know, give me the go ahead. We'll uh, we'll take the you know 85, 90 percent of them. We'll have it taken out. And and Kennedy says, well, um, what about the other 10 percent? He says, oh well, you know that'll be you know minimal damage. Um, if you want to see a really, just an amazing fictional take on sort of this era that has a character based on Curtis LeMay, uh, Kurt, Dr. Strangelove, which is one of the all-time great movies ever, you know, of the 20th century, uh, Stanley Kubrick, and um, George C. Scott's character in that movie, which is just a, a scene stealer, is based on Curtis LeMay, really. He's sort of arguing to the president then, you know, the president, I guarantee, you know, uh, uh, you know, 10 to, 10 to 20 million you know, casual, American casualties tops, depending on the rates. You know, it's not a lot, it, won't, it, won't, it won't be that bad. Right? This is kind of Curtis LeMay's approach to this. And at first, you know, Kennedy is thinking about this, but then he's sort of thinking, well, um, there's got to be a, another solution to this. You know, what, if, what if this does actually spark a nuclear exchange? So he's, he's telling his speechwriters to craft that speech I read at the beginning, but he's also working on other, other possibilities. Over the next week, Kennedy's team struggles with stress and fatigue, you know, I imagine, right, and they're not sleeping, you know, they're, they're worried about the, the world, literally, maybe the mistake they make could blow up the world. They're exploring their options. Finally, on October 22nd, Kennedy announces his response, his policy to the nation. What's interesting about this is that when he gives the speech, this is about seven days into the crisis, this is not just the first time Americans know 
about the missiles in Cuba and this and this uh, this you know, terrifying confrontation. It's also the first time the Soviets know that the Americans know that the missiles are there, right? And so the Soviets are taken aback as well. Kennedy announces that instead of attacking or negotiating, he's going to impose a quarantine, declaring that all Soviet ships approaching Cuba will either have to turn around or be searched for weapons. He also warns that any, any missiles launched from Cuba will, at the United States, will result in a full, mil, full nuclear response from the US. And all of a sudden, Khrushchev is in a tight spot. He's, he's placed the missiles there to sort of get a one-up on, on, on Kennedy in the Cold War to protect Castro, and instead it looks like he put Cuba even more in danger and put the Soviet Union in a showdown in which it still has, uh, it still just definitely has a disadvantage in terms of nuclear power. So the two sides are basically staring at each other, tensely waiting for, you know, who's going to blank, who's going to back down. While this is going on, several events almost start the war themselves that are totally unrelated. For example, um, uh, uh, U-2 flights continue over Soviet territory, even though, you know, just because they're routine. And Soviets often, several times, scramble thinking, oh my god, these are the bombers, these are bombing rounds. Uh, nuclear, the U.S. runs sort of a scheduled nuclear test in the Pacific that, that the Soviets initially think might be a strike on the, on the Eastern Soviet Union. So there's all these sort of events that almost set them off, right? Everybody's so edgy. Finally, on October 25th, the Soviet ships turn back from the U.S. quarantine. But there's still a chance that there could be a confrontation. There's still a chance that there could be uh, 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 some kind of a military strike. Americans are actually preparing for you know, the, the need to have some sort of military action to remove the missiles from Cuba. And here's the scary part. It didn't come out until 30 years later, in 1992, that Soviet troops in Cuba had tactical nuclear shells that they could deploy in their, in their mortars, like long-range mortars. And they actually had, believe it or not, this is stunning the Americans later, the, the Soviet commanders had authority to fire those nuclear mortars at invading U.S. troops um, without consulting further from, from Moscow. So if the U.S. had invaded, there would have at least been that initial the use of, of small, very small nuclear arms uh, 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 against them. It kind of could have sparked the whole thing. Right? Eventually, Khrushchev initiated talks. Castro opposed any deal that would remove the missiles. He wanted them as a sort of guarantee of, of Cuban sovereignty. But Khrushchev was wanting to get out of there somehow. So he sends two letters to Kennedy. One is when he's clearly completely soused, completely drunk, and, and is um, sort of rambling. And he demands, in the, in the course of this, uh, uh, a no invasion pledge in return for withdrawing the missiles. Then a second letter comes that seems to have been dictated by him either when he was sober or by other advisors saying, you can't send that first one, it doesn't make any sense, we need more. And they uh, demand something else. In addition to the no invasion pledge, they want the removal of, turkeys, uh, of, of missiles from Turkey. Eventually, Kennedy and his advisors agree to, to, to the no invasion pledge and they secretly agreed to withdraw the missiles from the Turkey. And people didn't find out about that for a long time after that. But that's how it sort of de escalated. In the wake of this, so this is sort of, the tensions ease off after that and they come to this agreement. In the wake of this, this has often been built from the very beginning, really, Kennedy built it up with this publicly. It's a victory, it's a US victory, it's a victory for Kennedy himself. But lots of his advisors admitted he was lucky, they were lucky they could have very easily initiated a nuclear war. And this is the last thing I'll say, and we're going to talk about this more when we get into our, our discussion, but one outcome of this, in terms of the Cold War, is that the US and the Soviet Union realized, okay, we can't let this happen again, get to the brink like that again, and so they try to improve communication. This is when the red phone is installed between the White House and the Kremlin to be able to communicate with one another. There's real efforts to try to avoid this kind of tension in the future. But U.S. officials take no such lessons from their, to apply to their policy in Cuba. 
hostility to Cuba that opened the, the really helped create this event in the first place is not altered. In fact, there's even more hostility for the Castro regime for inviting Soviet missiles in. And for the next 50 years, the U.S. tightens economic restrictions, supports economic and often quasi-military warfare against Cuba, including things that many U.S. officials admitted amount to state-sponsored terrorism, all the effort to, to overthrow Castro. And literally, this continued for the next 50 years, 53 years, 52 years, after this crisis until last Christmas, until last, last December when, when the Obama administration started to shift. And so it's one of the one of the things maybe we'll broach when we, when we have our discussion on Thursday. Okay? All right, that's all I got for you. Thank you for your attention.